There are some really great dead people. Today's guest helps us remember them through his appreciation of the humble obituary. He's Mo Rocca this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Ludis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Joining me as he does every week in the co-host chair is my great friend and colleague, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Each week, we talk about big issues with great guests, storytellers, novelists, journalists, and more to make sense of the big stories shaping the United States today. This week, we're joined by Mo Rocca. You know him from CBS Sunday Morning, but also from his podcast and book of the same name, Mobituaries. Mo, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me, and I apologize in advance for the world's most boring background. The room rate is going to get you. You just know it, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, for folks who don't know, uh, and you know, the three or four people left who don't know about uh, either the podcast or the book, what is a mobituary? A mobituary is... Uh, my appreciation for someone or something that didn't get the send off uh, it deserved the first time around or any send off at all. So it could be a house, someone who is still a household name like Audrey Hepburn or Sammy Davis Jr. who had the misfortune of, of in my opinion, having their death eclipsed or they're not being appreciated in the way they should be or somebody that we don't know uh, and we should know or so something so, you know, is there is there a particular rule, criteria? Is it your gut instinct about, you know, the the, the appropriateness of the send-off they got? How do you decide who gets an, a, a mobit? It's my gut instinct. I've learned in my career that if I'm interested in something, and uh, I'm, if I'm interested enough in something, I can get other people interested in it. That's the kind of the fun challenge of my career is can I make you interested in something that you didn't expect to be interested in? Um, anytime I've tried to game the system and think, oh, you know, I'm not really into that subject, but other people are, it's hot right now. It doesn't work, it falls flat. So you obviously are a fan of obituaries, real obituaries and, and your own version. Uh, where did this appreciation for obituaries come from? number one. And number two, do you think obituaries are underrated as a, a, a type of writing? It clearly takes a unique talent to write a good obituary. So there's a bunch of questions all, all packed into one. Yeah. Um, I got my love from my father. My father, who was not a gloomy person at all, used to always, maybe the most optimistic person I'll ever know, used to always say, the obits is my favorite section of the newspaper. And um, I think it's because my father had a real sense of the romance of life um, and a good obit kind of has a sweep uh, and a romance. It feels sort of like um, uh, the, the movie trailer for, for an Oscar winning biopics of the highs, the lows, the triumphs, the tragedies. And uh, um, any good obit writer will tell you that a, a good obituary is really about someone's life, not their death. As for whether it's underrated, um, I think that uh, um, it used to be a dead end, a graveyard, where they <laughs> dump, right? Oh, oh, hold on. But um, it used to be where, uh, where um, newspaper writers were put out to pasture, and that's changed now. Um, I went to ObitCon, which I highly recommend. It's so much better than Comic-Con. Um, <laughs> Is that really a thing? <laughs> with the Society of Professional Obit Writers. Um, and a bunch from the Washington Post were there. They, with all that Bezos money, they really beefed up their staff. But it, the writers there love what they do because um, they get to write about sports, entertainment, politics, the arts. Uh, it's kind of a great beat, and it's it's arguably the most purely narrative form of of journalism. So I don't know what newspapers you read on a daily basis. I'm assuming probably quite a few. Do you go to the obituary sections of those papers first i well first of all i i feel a little guilty saying this i do um 
I read most newspapers online. Uh, and so I think it, in the days when you'd actually pick up a, a paper paper when I would, I would flip to that section usually first. Um, now I kind of scroll through and see if something's interesting uh, to me. But um, but sure, I, I, I mean, I, I love a well-written obit. I love the little details. I love how people got their start. If an obit contains certain little details that kind of help you make sense of the person, um, you know, maybe some experience they had when they were a kid. I remember this is going way back and I read this in a collection um, the obituary of Alfred Hitchcock in the New York Times, it mentioned that as a young boy, his father, kind of an early version of Scared Straight, had the local jailer in their English village throw him into a jail cell and slam the door behind him and say, that's what happens to bad little boys. And first of all, can you imagine how <laughs> that can be? Um, but that, that sound of the clanging um, uh, the jail door sort of rang in his head all of his life. And of course, a lot of his work had to do with crime and punishment and mistaken identity. So um, details like that are really exciting. By the way, the Providence Journal is the longest continuously running daily newspaper in America. <clears throat> yes, yes. I have seen that on television, I got a lot of hate from the Hartford Current people, but they, be <laughs> they began as a weekly, and that's not my fault. No, I, no, we, we've been we've been publishing every day without interruption, come war, famine, whatever, plague, since 1829. I'm, I'm aware of that, uh, the Hartford Current sort of back and forth there, but sorry, we, we, we own that one. <laughs> little, little inner New England rivalry there. Um, Mo, I, so uh, it was interesting to me that the book begins with a chapter. Uh, it's, it, we're not just talking about uh, uh, mobituaries for people, but oftentimes things. And the book begins with a, with a mobituary uh, to dragons. And yeah. the thing that struck me about that about that chapter is that you do everything from sort of discuss the misappropriation of, a, of, of or mistranslation of a Greek term uh, the creation of mythology, uh, the 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 rise of science, and even Peter, Paul, and Mary. And so I'm curious, why did you begin the book with a chapter about dragons? Well, first of all, I want to give props to my wonderful co-author, Jonathan Greenberg, and we had a, a particular fun on that chapter. Um, I wanted to begin with a surprise for, um, to sort of set the table um, for the audience so that they would realize this wasn't going to be just about typical people obituaries. This was an obituary for an idea, um, Death of the Fantastic, we called it. Um, and I found it um, by reading a biography of Thomas Paine by Craig T. Nelson. Craig D. Nelson. Craig T. Nelson was the guy on that TV show, Coach. But anyway, so, <laughs> um, and, and this is part of what was so kind of exhilarating for me. There was a one sentence parenthetical about the Enlightenment and how Carl Linnaeus, a name I remembered from high school biology, great Swedish botanist, um, went to an exhibit of a seven-headed hydra, a hot exhibit in the then city-state of Hamburg uh, in the 1700s. And he walked in there and realized this isn't a real creature. Everyone's going nuts for it, like it was a Picasso show at MoMA or something. And uh, and in fact, it was a bunch of snake skins sewn together with some weasel skulls shoved in there and the guts of some other animal. Um, and just pretty much like that, like puff, if you will, this millennia's long, millennia long belief in the existence of dragons disappeared um, pretty quickly. And I thought that was such a fascinating line of demarcation um, between believing in something um, fantastic and and then realizing it wasn't true. Um, and also the book is organized sort of chronologically and that ended up falling first and kind of in the depths, if you will. So you have uh, a mobituary title called Death of a Diagnosis and you remind readers that until 1973, homosexuality was considered a mental illness. Uh, we're taping this the day after the Supreme Court ruled that businesses cannot fire homosexual gay people or transgender people. Talk to us first about about the APA and, and how that has changed. But what, what was the bat? Why would they? Why would is, is why was that considered a mental illness in 1973? That's not that long ago, really. 
not that long ago at all. And I wrote about it because personally growing up gay, um, and I still am gay, but um, I, um, I remember as, as a, um, as I just want to make that clear. No, as uh, I remember reading in the 1974 World Book, it hadn't quite caught up to the news yet, but reading the entry on homosexuality, um, um, which, you know, reads like ancient history now uh, and talks about it in part as a mental illness, or th that's at least how it was classified up until 1973. Um, and what an impact that made on me. Um, and so I was interested for obvious reasons in the story of how it um, became declassified, but also, you know, the damage that the diagnoses can do. Of, of course, a lot of the members of the APA were of the American Psychiatric Association were well-meaning, um, uh, but by including it in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, it had it validated a lot of harsh anti-gay laws, a lot of harsh medical treatments up until the early 1950s there were lobotomies performed on, on gay people. Um, so um, uh, they were rare at that point, but they were still being done. Um, so, you know, for younger people, I think this just, this seems fantastic. They can't believe it's true that something like that was happening that recently. Um, but yeah, so I thought that that would, it, it, was, it was important to, to remember the depth of that diagnosis. So, Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, it, 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 there certainly uh, is a very different consciousness overall. How do you how do you reconcile that in, in the year 2020 in, in a country as supposedly, quote unquote, advanced as as America is? How do I reconcile it? I think. You know, maybe to a fault, I. Um, try to be understanding, even compassionate about um, people's understanding of, of, of people that are not like themselves. I mean, I think there is willful, not understanding, willful intolerance. And then I just think there are people that haven't been um, exposed to gay people, or certainly there are a lot of people that have never met or don't think they've ever met a transgender person. It's interesting, somebody, a friend of mine who um, works at a big, a big company um, said to me that he takes around new employees, or he has, and in certain cases has taken around employees who have said something um, dismissive of, of transgender people and has introduced this these employees to people to colleagues that they didn't realize were actually transgender but in any case i think um i think gay rights is interesting and it's it's a different it's it's been a different progression um than with other groups in that it's sort of a i think of it as a revolution from within you look at somebody i think it's like rob portman or obviously dick cheney politicians who i think it's fair to say would not have been as sympathetic to gay rights that they didn't have gay children. And so in a way, it's like um, this is a revolution that's that's sort of a, occurred because I suppose it pops up randomly in families of all different kinds. So it's only a matter of time, I think, before, before most everyone comes to know and love a gay person. So I, I guess I'm optimistic. Well, you mentioned revolution. One of the obituaries is about uh, uh, Thomas Paine uh, and his uh, revolutionary writings. You, you you have a litany of reasons of uh, or litany of uh, of ways in which someone would become a top tier founding father. Uh, and and Thomas Paine doesn't pass the muster. But he he one of the things that you wrote about is his um his essay written in 1789, The Rights of Man. Uh, in which he proposed, and I'm quoting you here, universal suffrage, free public education, progressive taxation, guaranteed basic income, and limits on property. And I, I kept hearing uh, Andrew Yang as I was reading that. Uh, what does that say about uh, sort of the long evolution of American uh, politics that uh, 200 and almost 50 years later now, uh, we're still debating a lot of those same issues? Well, it tells you one thing that somebody like Thomas Paine 
deserves a Broadway musical. I mean, this guy was a real radical. Okay, I know the other guys get all, get more love, obviously Hamilton, but uh, but Thomas Paine was 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 extraordinary. I think what it also tells you is is the importance of having an easy to take personality. I mean, this one was fun for me because um, um, I feel like we've all met somebody. I know I have like a Thomas Paine, somebody who kind of only has one setting. The other founding fathers were were revolutionaries that managed to transition into statesmen, right? You could say that they mellowed. Um, Thomas Paine didn't have that other setting. I mean, he went from one revolution to the next, to the next. Um, and um, he was certainly intemperate um, and he made certain mistakes like, you don't trash George Washington like he did in the letter that was published, you know, the father of, uh, of our country. And then you don't trash the son of God. He went on to trash Jesus, right, in the age of reason. So, I mean, this guy gets props for being a true believer and saying what he really thinks. But sometimes that can backfire, I suppose. Um, but, yeah, reading some of, of the things that he believed in that are still coming up today, I mean, it sort of redefines what a revolutionary is. I mean, he has extraordinary foresight. So here we are in the middle of June and there have been weeks of protests, Black Lives Matter, um, directed for reform, directed against police brutality, and clearly uh, examining, exploring, and discussing the relationship between race and power in America today. And, and those are themes that are in your book, which obviously was written before what yeah. has happened uh, since the death of George Floyd. What motivated you to, to include those? And they're very powerful stories and of course belong there, but what drew you to those stories? Well, I like this kind of Moses Joshua metaphor <laughs> that I'm just going to push, which is the idea that there are these people ahead of their time, the pioneers before the pioneers, I call them forgotten forerunners, who get to a certain place um, and they can't go farther. And then somebody picks up the baton much later and completes the journey. Um, this happens with Moses Fleetwood Walker, who is really the first black man to, to play what passes for professional baseball. And Major League Baseball has recognized him. Obviously, Jackie Robinson, 1947, it's extraordinary what happens. He is a pioneer. But that journey had, been, had begun in Toledo with a, a team called the Toledo Blue Stockings in 1884 with a man named Moses Fleetwood Walker. And when I went to Toledo, um, there was a, a, a front office guy working for the current Toledo team, the Toledo Mud Hens, which people will remember if they love the TV show MASH. Klinger was a big fan. But this guy said to me, his name is Rob Worsinski. He said, for a color line to be broken, it has to be drawn in the first place. And I found that kind of profound, this idea that, that you had black men for a very short time in the 1880s playing what passed for, for Major League Baseball, pro baseball, um, and that created a backlash. Cap Anson, a very famous Chicago player, at one point said, I will not go onto the field with, another, with, with a black player. And that kind of laid down the color line at that point. Um, and then Jackie Robinson comes along 63 years later. Um, I, I said on this theme because I'm a big presidential history buff, and I was quite literally reading a book of presidential trivia. I like the guys that you can't remember were actually president. They're usually between Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt. They're from Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Chester Allen Arthur, perhaps the most obscure of them, I read that in this presidential trivia book, I read in a couple of lines that as a young lawyer, he represented a woman named Elizabeth Jennings, who in 1854 was kicked off of a horse-drawn streetcar, the public transportation of its day in lower Manhattan. And she sued in civil court and she won. And that that led to the integration of, of New York's transportation system shortly after the civil war. And I thought, this is an amazing story and it's buried in a book of presidential trivia. It's not even a book about civil rights. It's a book about that I'm reading because I'm into obscure presidents and their factoids and facial hair. And uh, um, and of course, 
that in and of in and of itself is significant that this is a an a extraordinary story that by the way at the time got a lot of coverage and she had a new york times obituary right she wasn't i mean um um she was a prominent figure but that had been forgotten and you know it's a reminder it was a reminder to me that history does not move in a straight line that led me i always wanted to do a story on the black congressman of reconstruction I know that sounds like the name of a funk band, but it really is this group of men, extraordinary men, 16 African-American men during the decade of the 1870s, not the 1970s, the 1870s served in the US Congress, two in the Senate, the rest in the House. More than half of them had been enslaved. I mean, and, and that story to me captured the great promise of Reconstruction before Reconstruction failed. And it made me wonder, did it have to fail? But but it also, again, made me think, boy, things really don't move in a in a straight line. I mean, this was this this period, that decade, I think Afri obviously women couldn't vote. African American men in the South were voting at an over 90% uh, um, uh, uh, rate. Um, uh, there was extraordinary optimism. Um, I, and I also have to add that the reason I like that story is when Reconstruction began to fall apart and, and we really focused on these, the, the congressmen, because it's easier to tell a story about people than about an idea, I think. Um, when they were in Washington in the 1870s, they socialized with their white colleagues. Um, one of them, Blanche K. Bruce, had a Supreme Court justice and his wife come over to their house. They were also snubbed by a lot of congressmen, of course. But then there were editorials written scolding the racist congressmen who were snubbing the black congressmen. And I thought that that was really important to remember that you can't, forgive me, paint everything black and white. I mean, there were good people back then that wanted this to work good white people who wanted this to work. So again, things don't move in a straight line. We're not, we're not so much better than they were back then. You know, you, you've got a, a, a obituary in the book uh, for Sammy Davis Jr. That um, honestly, when I read it, it moved me. Uh, and I'm wondering what drew you uh, in particular to Sammy Davis Jr. Um, well, I love talent. I love, you know, on CBS Sunday morning, when I do profile, I do a lot of profiles. And, and when there are people in the arts and media, I want to do them if they're talented, not if they're not just if they're famous. And this guy had so much talent. And he wasn't just it wasn't just that he could do so many different things, sing, act, dance, play musical instruments, um, a pistol spinning routine, gun spinning routine, impressionist. Um, it's that he was one of the best in all of these individual things. And, that, and that's really important. He wasn't just multi-talented. It was in each of these things, he was really great. And he loved performing. He didn't spend a day in school. I'm not saying that's a good thing, but one of the things I loved about him is that he said, looking back, it's unfortunate. And yet he's still glad that as a child, he could perform because he loved it so much and um um and i had been i had watched a um a performance in st louis in the mid-1960s maybe it was 1964 with him and the rat pack and i thought it was extraordinary how he walked a line um uh making ethnic jokes but never humiliating himself um somehow he got a bad rap along the way even though he was at the March on Washington, he was down at Selma. Harry Belafonte himself said he didn't understood why Sammy didn't get credit for those things. Um, but obviously he had, he was sort of between two worlds for all of his life. Um, and I just think the fact that he was able to continuously be this brilliant and maintain his dignity throughout is just extraordinary. He was, by the way, the first um, African American to imitate white performers. He did an amazing Jimmy Cagney and Humphrey Bogart and um, Cary Grant, and uh, um, that was a big deal. That was really risky to do that. He he got the the, the crap kicked out of him in the army, of course, um, and 
part of coping with that, I think, was just being this brilliant entertainer. So your book dedication to your father was exactly a year ago today. Wow. Pre-publication, obviously. So if you had to write the headline for a Mobit for the last 12 months, and, and we're, we're almost out of time here, but if you had to write that headline, what would it be? You got about 30 seconds, Mo. <laughs> um, the clock is ticking. <laughs> so, it, I mean, I'm speaking that this is the headline. The clock is ticking. So please, please try to live in the present as much as possible. I mean, that, that was my headline, I guess. It's a, it's a great headline, and Mo, it's a great book. Congratulations on it, on the podcast. Is it, uh, You're in the middle of season two on the podcast? We finished season two, and season three will, will hopefully be available not too long in the future. Well, it's, it's, it's definitely worth everybody's read and everybody's time. Congratulations on all your success. You. Mo Rocca, uh, CBS uh, Sunday Morning, and Mo Bituaries. Uh, that's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter, or visit PellCenter.org, where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square. Mm -hmm.